Psalm 37, verses 1 to 11. Don't be worried on account of the wicked. Don't be jealous of those who do wrong. They will soon disappear like grass that dries up. They will die like plants that wither. Trust in the Lord and do good. Live in the land and be safe. Seek your happiness in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desire. Give yourself to the Lord, trust in him and he will help you. He will make your righteousness shine like the noonday sun. Be patient and wait for the Lord to act. Don't be worried about those who prosper or those who succeed in their evil plans. Don't give in to worry or anger, it only leads to trouble. Those who trust in the Lord will possess the land, but the wicked will be driven out. Soon the wicked will disappear, you may look for them, but you won't find them. But the humble will possess the land and enjoy prosperity and peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The reading is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 to 13. May you always be joyful in your union with the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Show a gentle attitude toward everyone. The Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything, but in all your prayers ask God for what you need, always asking him with a thankful heart and God's peace, which is far beyond human understanding, will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with Christ Jesus. In conclusion, my friends, fill your minds with those things that are good and that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely and honourable. Put into practice what you learned and received from me, both from my words and from my actions, and the God who gives us peace will be with you. In my life in union with the Lord, it is a great joy to me that after so long a time you once more had the chance of showing that you care for me. I don't mean that you stopped caring for me, you just had no chance to show it. And I am not saying this because I feel neglected, for I have learned to be satisfied with what I have. I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have more than enough. I have learned this secret, 
so that anywhere, at any time, I am content, whether I am full or hungry, whether I have too much or too little. I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. This is why I tell you, do not be worried about food and drink you need in order to stay alive, or about clothes for your body. After all, isn't life worth more than food? And isn't the body worth more than clothes? Look at the birds. They do not plant seeds, gather a harvest and put it in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth much more than birds? Can any of you live a bit longer by worrying about it? And why worry about clothes? Look how the wild flowers grow. They do not work or make clothes for themselves. But I tell you that not even King Solomon with all his wealth had clothes as beautiful as one of these flowers. It is God who clothes the wild grass, Grass that is here today and gone tomorrow, burned up in the oven. Won't he be all the more sure to clothe you? What little faith you have! So do not start worrying. Where will my food come from, or my drink, or my clothes? These are the things the pagans are always concerned about. Your Father in heaven knows that you need all these things. Instead, be concerned above everything else with the kingdom of God and with what he requires of you, and he will provide you with all these other things. So do not worry about tomorrow. It will have enough worries of its own. There is no need to add to the troubles each day brings. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord.
is not the bread we break, a sharing in our Lord. Is not the cup we bless, the blood of Christ outpoured? Seeds scattered and sown, we gathered and God grant that I may speak and you may hear in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How content are you? Put the question another way. How, can't or, how content are you with life in general today? Or even more specifically, how content are you with your personal life in these days? On a scale of one to ten, how content would you say that you are? And when you think about it, what would make your life more content today? Answer this for yourself. I would be happier if I had more money, if I had a better house, if I was not sickly, if I had a better wife or husband, if my children were less of a worry, if I belonged to a better church, if I did not have a physical handicap, so we could go on. Would we be content if we did not have such issues or problems like this in our life. The prolification of pictures and adverts on TV, on the internet, and billboards, and social media are all part of the problems for us today. Adverts can breed discontent by telling us that our lives are just not right 
or sufficiently fulfilled unless we have what it is that is being promoted. Adverts tell us that we need more or that we deserve better. Adverts lead us to ask and to say, if only, if only I could have that, if only I could do this. Our tendency is to look for things that would make us happier and more content. The result, tragically, though, is ongoing discontentment. Listen to what Paul wrote in his letter to the church at Philippi. I have learned the secret of being content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, with the living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul never had an easy life. Listen to what he wrote about himself. I have been in prison frequently. Five times I received 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked and I spent a day and night in the open sea, and I've been in danger from bandits and from people all my life. And yet Paul could still say, I have learned the secret of being content. And when Paul wrote these words, he was in a notoriously bad prison in Rome, awaiting his public execution. How could he have been content when he faced such a string of problems in his life and ministry? What was his secret? Now listen to this. What is it that brings us contentment in life? Contentment lies in who we are and whose we are. Contentment lies in who we are and whose we are. And I'll come back to that later. Discontent is found in what we do not have or what difficult experiences we may, ever, we may ever had in life. A lack of contentment causes us to look horizontally, to look at what others have and what others perhaps have experienced. Or I listen to my feelings and so I'm never satisfied. But contentment invites me to look vertically to God, remembering what Jesus has accomplished for me. So again, what is Paul's secret of being content? Paul knew whose he was. Paul knew that he was a child of God and an apostle called by God. Through the cross, he knew that he had been freed from being chained to his past sins. Through the cross, he knew that his sins had been forgiven and that his salvation was secure. Through the cross, he knew he had friendship with God. And through the cross, he knew that his eternal future in heaven was guaranteed. Paul also taught that there is nothing in heaven or on earth that could ever separate a Christian from the presence and love of God. Certainly he knew that nothing he had ever experienced in life had ever separated him from God and his love. And certainly he knew that nothing that he will experience in the future will ever separate him from God's presence and love. Paul knew that God would never leave nor forsake him for he knew that God loved him with an everlasting love. Paul knew that in all things God works for love, sorry, for in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Paul knew contentment because he knew Jesus who had saved him. Paul was content because he had been filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul knew contentment because he trusted God the Father who loved him. Contentment came to Paul because he knew whose he was, for he looked to God, the one who loved him, and he did not look to his life experiences. And Paul wrote of himself, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, what about us? Let me return to my original question. 
Do we know the contentment that we see in Paul? Do we know the God who is described in the book of Hebrews as the author and finisher of our faith? Do we fix our spiritual eyes on him? For contentment comes to us when we forget what lies behind us and when we too strain or press on to whatever lies before us in the future. Like Paul, let us fix our spiritual lie, eyes on the Lord Jesus. Remember to whose you are. If your life is found in Jesus, then like Paul, look to the cross as a sign of your salvation. Remember that your sins too have been forgiven. Remember that you are no longer chained to the past. Remember that your salvation is secure. Remember too that God is your friend. And remember that your eternal future in heaven is guaranteed. Remember too that Paul declared, whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. All this is yours, for you are one of his chosen ones. As Peter wrote in his first letter, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is who you are. This is whose you are. Fix your eyes on him who loves you and who works for good in your life. So we do not fix our eyes on the things of the world that breed discontent. Do not look around in envy. Do not compare yourself with other people. And in the season of Lent, when we are reminded of the Ten Commandments, remember especially the Tenth Commandment, which is, do not covet. Do not covet what we see in other people or in what they possess. Do not dwell on the hurtful experiences maybe you have experienced in the past. Get rid of any if-only thoughts you may have. But rather, as Paul wrote, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Our New Testament reading this morning included some beautiful and challenging words which would result in us experiencing contentment. And I quote, Finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul understood the influence that one's thoughts can have on one's life. And whatever we allow to occupy our minds will inevitably influence our speech and our action. So let us be very careful as to what we read, listen to, or watch on TV. If we take into our minds what is untrue, fake sometimes, whatever is ugly, morally wrong, violent, and full of abuse, these will lead without any doubt to discontentment. Alternatively, whatever is noble and true will influence our minds for good and lead to greater contentment. And so Paul could write, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Finally, may I remind you of the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount that were read to us earlier. Yeah, Jesus was encouraging us not to worry and be anxious. And I quote, Jesus said, Do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Here Jesus is affirming or pointing to this teaching. Looking to Jesus and his kingdom leads to contentment. Anxiety leads to discontent. 
And I conclude with wise words from the late John Stott, the great Anglican evangelical, who said these words, contentment is the secret of inward peace. I repeat, he said, contentment is the secret of inward peace. And inward peace we could also call shalom, the shalom of Jesus. And so, Lord, we ask that by your Holy Spirit, you just continue to speak to us and direct our thoughts, that we may look to you and not to the things around us, that we may look to you and be reminded of who you are and what you have done for us. We ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. The Collect for the Second Sunday of Lent God of the Covenant, you promise mercy and hope for all. Gather us to yourself in tenderness, so that, assured of your faithfulness, we may live to your praise and glory. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Some years ago, I had the privilege of traveling to St. Paul's Church in Odessa with a Coventry cross of nails, which was taken to that church to recognize their experience of having been destroyed and then rebuilding and offering their church as a place of reconciliation, a place of peace and of hope for the future. Soon after that visit, which I made in 2013, as unrest began to erupt around in uh, Ukraine and in Odessa in particular, I know that that cross was taken out onto the streets and used as a symbol to gather around for people of faith to pray for the peace of that country and that city. The symbol of the Coventry Cross of Nails and one of the originals is in the high altar cross behind me, is a symbol of Christ's presence in the midst of destruction, a sign that even when things seem perhaps even beyond human hope, we can turn to God and find in him the grace and the love and the promise to look to the future. So today, we stand with our sisters and brothers in Ukraine and also in Russia to pray that this unrest which is there in that region at the moment may not escalate into war, that there may be a found a way to live together in peace. But the way to do that always begins as we recognize our own failings, our own interior lack of peace, as well as the lack of peace in the world. So to do that, I'm going to use the Coventry Litany of Reconciliation, a prayer which we've been using here in Coventry now for over 60 years, a prayer that lists some of those ways in which we have destroyed God's peace in our own lives and in our world, to seek God's forgiveness and to pray that all may find a way to journey from a fractured past towards a shared future. The Coventry Litany starts and ends with verses from the New Testament. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The hatred which divides nation from nation, race from race, class from class. Father, forgive the covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Father, forgive. The greed, which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth. Father, forgive. Our envy of the welfare and happiness of others. Father, forgive. Our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Father, forgive. The lust which dishonours the bodies of men, women and children. Father, forgive. The pride which leads us to trust in ourselves and not in God. Father, forgive. Be kind to one another 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Loving God, we pray for the peace of Ukraine and of Russia. We pray that your grace may be close to those who live in fear and anxiety, that your wisdom, courage and compassion may guide those in positions of government and of responsibility. We pray that the people of those lands may know your gift of peace, which passes all human understanding. Holy and loving God, we ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless you, wherever you are, looking in, caught up, or praying for this conflict. And may God lead us all in his paths of peace. Amen. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with power over war or peace, for wisdom discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children, at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen.